U.S. Army's flagship uh, training program. And so it was based in 1946, and a lot of the graduates who were coming out of it, um, you know, were uh, you know were starting to pop up in different countries, like you know, um, that were had a lot of dictatorships in Guatemala, uh, in Nicaragua, under the Somoza dictatorship. You know, all these SOA graduates were like kind of populating the ranks of, of, of these of these dictators. Um, and in 1984, um, the president of Panama um, said, you know. Uh, this was all part of getting the, there was a big national uprising, you know, part of it was getting the canal back, you know, the U.S. had control over the Panama Canal. Um, and um, part of it was the president also said, you know, the, the SOA is the biggest base for destabilization in Latin America. Um, so that got kicked out and they moved it to Fort Benning to a, a more friendly area. And Fort, in Columbus, Georgia was actually picked, um, Fort Benning was actually picked, it, Columbus is the city where Fort Benning is. And, Actually, Fort Benning is larger than Columbus. Um, Fort Benning is actually bigger than D.C. Um, but Columbus was picked because it um, kind of showed it was like a, a, a true location of what middle America looks like, what, what, what real America looks like, you know, um, kind of the American values that they hope to impart to, to Latin American soldiers. And, you know, part of the training, at least in the 80s um, and 90s, was going to Disneyland, um, you know, going to going to all these places. Now they also take them to Atlanta to see the Coke Center. You know, they do other trips to Washington, D.C. You can bring your family up. Um, Latin American soldiers who are trained can do all these, right? Um, so taking a step back, um, 1984 comes to Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, and in, um, you guys have heard about all the wars that were happening in Central America, right? You know, Nicaragua, there was the war there. The U.S. was backing the Contras, who were killing a lot of people um, um, after the Sandinistas um, came to power. You know, so it's a, um, a socialist, communist, um, you know, peasant-based movement that took power in 1979. Um, and um, afterwards, you know, the, the government, the U.S. government, started supporting the Contras, which were a brutal, you know, organization um, that was killing a lot of folks. And a lot of those people were led by SOA grads, trained by SOA grads, right? In Guatemala, you know, you had 200,000 people killed there, um, and a lot of the, we're making more connections, SOA grads there. Right now, um, Efrain Rios Montt, uh, I don't know if you guys are following everything that's going on in Guatemala. He was the dictator, um, some say president, some say dictator, um, from 1980 to 81 to 83. Um, and in his 17 months in power, um, uh, I don't remember the number, maybe Dominique might remember, thousands of people were killed, um, and uh, 2,600. 2,600, specifically 2,600, but in Guatemala during the entire Civil War, you know, 200,000 people were killed. But um, Rios Montt is now under uh, invest is on, on trial for genocide, and he was an SOA grad. Um, and there was a priest named uh, Roy Bourgeois, um, if any of you have heard of him. Um, he was seeing what was happening in El Salvador. You know, you had the killings of the nuns in 1980. You had, um, you know, the, the murder of Archbishop Oscar Romero. You probably know about him, right? You guys, you guys know who he is. You want to, you want to tell us who he is, Andy? Um, he's the priest in San Salvador, El Salvador, and then he became um, bishop. And um, he began um, not as socially conscious as he ended. Um, he had a real conversion when, while he was uh, bishop, and. Um, really begin to reach out to the poor and the be the voice for the voiceless and the marginalized in the city of San Salvador and throughout all of El Salvador during the awful civil war. Um, people were being killed and he was being out against it and authorities told him to stop and he didn't. And, um, and then when he was uh, celebrating mass one day, he was shot in the heart for speaking out. Truth to God. Well, that was, that was a great history, actually. It's more in depth than I would have gone. <laughs> That's very great. Um, and actually, two of his three killers were trained at the School of the Americas, right? Um, and so um, all that was happening in El Salvador was really shaking, you know, the, the solidarity movement here. People were really, you know, moving on El Salvador, talking about Nicaragua, you know, in touch with Guatemala. And one priest, Father Roy Bourgeois, um, who had been um, um, in Bolivia, in Bolivia and was tortured under the regime there, which was an SOA, um, uh, led by an SOA graduate, um, Hugo Banzi. Um, you know, and he went to El Salvador as well. He was in touch with the folks there. And, um, you know, he, uh, he came back and he started, um, you know, he did a, his first, uh, first action actually was at Fort Benning 
1983, where he climbed a pine tree and um, played Os Oscar Romero's um, homily, last homily, to the Salvadoran uh, soldiers there. Um, you know, and he said he spent uh, 15 months in prison for that action. It started snowballing. Um, in 1987, there was another action where he and some other folks went and threw their blood all over the uh, SOA's Hall of Fame. And the SOA's Hall of Fame was where they had the pictures and moment, uh, you know, like memorabilia of um, SOA graduates. You know, they had Pinochet's sword. As Pinochet himself wasn't a graduate, but, you know, a lot of the... Um, do you guys know who Pinochet was? He was the dictator of Chile. Um, came to power in 1973 to, through a coup d'etat which was supported by the U.S. government um, against the socialist government there. And a lot of the, a lot of the Ch Chilean folks were trained at the SOA, right? So they had his sword there, you know, they had pictures of Hugo Banzer Suarez there, named as like a, an outstanding graduate, and, and Roy and them, they went through their blood all over it, and apparently it was like, the stain, the smell of the blood was there for like months, you know, um, but it was a very powerful action, right? Um, and in 1989, there was uh, the killing of Selina and Elba Ramos, um, uh, Selina was 16 years old, a 14 year old, year old, and her mother Elba, um, and six Jesuit priests um, at the University of Central America, um, and that was carried out by SOA graduates. Um, the Truth Report, the UN Truth Report, in El Salvador said that 19 out of 23 people who participated in that massacre were trained at the School of the Americas. Um, and out of that massacre, was the School of the Americas Watch Movement was born, right? Um, and so on the one year anniversary of 1990, they started a, a fast at the gates in November. Um, and that's kind of built up over the years. Um, so, you know, thousands of people come, you know, each year. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a really powerful, powerful movement. If you ever get a chance to go, you can also talk to Anne. And, you know, she'll probably tell you what it's like. Um, we read out that it's, it's one weekend in November. Um, this year it's going to be, um, you know, like the... 20 something. It's always the weekend before Thanksgiving. Uh, that's how you can always remember. Um, and you know, it's, it brings together a very diverse sector of, of the US and of all of the Americas, actually. Um, you know, you have speakers coming in from Latin America talking about what's going on with mining right now, you know, talking about what's going on with mining in El Salvador and linking that up with people who are doing mining work in, you know, the, um, against the mountaintop removal. You know, uh, there's a lot of connections built there. Um, we have people coming up, uh, priests coming up, uh, unionists um, from all over the Americas, and then you know people like yourselves coming up from all over the United States as well. Um, and it's really on Sunday we read out the names of the people who've been killed at the vigil or at the, at the vigil. Oof. Um, <laughs> okay, no one dies when you go to the protest. Or, yeah. <laughs> we read out the names of the people who've been killed by SOA graduates, right? And then we say presente, um, meaning that they're here. Um, there's a lot more. There's a lot more information we can talk about the SOA, but I'm not sure if you guys want to take a break and ask a question or something a little bit more. What you might have heard. Friends of the SOA, the people who protested. What is their reasoning for continuing to happen? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know. It, you know, it's, it's important to remember that the School of America was, was open during um, the Cold War, right? Um, so that kind of sets it in context for you right away. The U.S. says that they were fighting um, communism for the spread of communism. Um, and, you know, then the, but the pretext has changed. We always say that, you know, the, the training continues with a different name, right? Um, first was against the fight against communism. Now it's the fight against um, terrorism or the fight against drug trafficking, right? So, you know, we we're talking about, we're, so that brings in the question of the war on drugs in Colombia, or the war on drugs in Mexico, right? Um, or, you know, talking about, oh, well, we have to, there's, there's, there's Hezbollah starting up in, in you know, having connect in Ven connections in Venezuela or in, in the Iguazu area, you know? So there's always these different pretexts. Um, um, you know, one of the main things, and one thing we always talk about too, um, you guys, have you guys heard about um, the Monroe Doctrine? Anyone want to remind everyone else what that is? The well, US exerting its force in the Western Hemisphere, basically closing it off to anybody else, saying, um, we'll take control over here, Europe, you stay out. And um, a lot of trade treaties coming out of that that really just basically benefit the US and its own interests and its economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, 1823 is set up, and 
like Annie was saying, you know, it's like to keep the other empires out. You know, it was under this it was under this pretext of you know we want to protect the new democracies in Latin America or the new republics in Latin America. Um, you know, that was they were getting out the colonialists. You know, they're saying these are new republics and we're going to defend freedom. We're going to defend democracy in Latin America. But it was really on the you know with the guise of um, of demo under the guise of democracy to protect these um, you know trade routes. Um, protect all these economic interests, right? And it's always important to note that um, actually the Monroe Doctrine has never really been repealed. You know, it still exists today, you know, um, so we still have that um, saying, we still have that mentality that Latin America is our backyard that we have to protect. Um, and with that comes a whole series of reasons why there should be U.S. intervention in Latin America, right? Um, so that's, you know, right now at, um, kind of following up on your question, um, at, at the School of the Americas, which uh, I don't know if you guys know, it changed its name in 2001. We were about to win in Congress um, in 2000, and then the Pentagon decided to preempt a, a new vote that was coming up and said, we're going to close down the School of the Americas. They closed down December 17, 2000. And then one month later, they opened up um, January 17, 2001, um, on the same building, in the same building, you know, basically the same instructors and, uh, and basically the same curriculum. Um, and um, you know, at um, with with um, at the new school, they called it WINSEC at Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. They don't call it SLA anymore. Um, you know, they're they're trained. They're, now their courses aren't necessarily about counterinsurgency. They don't have these names, counterinsurgency, which is very linked to like the fight against communism. Right? Now they have counter narcotics, right? Counter terrorism, right? They're teaching people how to use drones, how to fly drones, right? So these are all, you know, when we think about what's happening in our world today, the war on drugs, you know, the war on terror, you know, the use of drones, you know, these are all new ways of repressing social movements, right? In, in, the, in the end, it's about repressing social movements. Um, and the question we always ask is, at the benefit of who, right? Um, but maybe you guys have some answers, too, for that, or other questions. I mean, what happens even in you know in Appalachia here with the coal, the coal mining and the mountaintop removal? Do you guys follow that a little bit? You guys know about the mountaintop removal stuff? You get paid off. What's that? A lot of times they get paid off. They get paid off. Yeah. Who gets paid off? Like um, the not the leaders necessarily, but like the workers on the lower level who need the money to support their family. That's 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 one thing. That's definitely one thing. Um, also, I think, you know, you're seeing, we're seeing a lot of protests now in areas like Kentucky, you know, West Virginia, Western Virginia, you know, um, of communities that are resisting the exploitation of their lands um, to get these resources, you know, um, and they're being met with a lot of repression, right? They're being, being met with a lot of, um, you know, police action, right? Um, and so, you know, ma making, those, making those connections, seeing what happens in our own country and seeing what happens in, in other countries too. We look at, um, I mean, a, a war that happened very recently or that's still going on right now, you guys know what happened with the Iraq war, right? Why did we go into Iraq? Or what was the reason why we went into Iraq? And why, why, what, was the real, what was the reason that we were told that we had to go to Iraq? And what was, perhaps, what are some theories about maybe why we really went there? We went in because we were told there was weapons of mass destruction. Anything else? You got another? Well, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Those are things we were told, but as TJ was saying, um, it's not hard to think that resource control is um, in part charge of, like, of uh, making sure that military operations called we were con we were able to influence uh, like. Part of the world, how to place a foothold in part of the world so that we could control and, um, right more of someone is resources like oil and things like that. And give them the so resources like them. oil, definitely. Is that definitely. Yeah. yeah. So there's always that, you know, that kind of gets back to your question too, like why, mm -hmm. why, yeah. you know, why, why is the U.S. Yeah, want this, you know, why does it exist? Like the 70s. You know, why does the school of America exist? Why is there okay. militarization? So we do militarization, right? Yeah. That's well, the question we always well, ask. Well, you know. yeah. So and the SOA is a good symbol of that to see like what the U.S. Is, has been doing for many decades now in Latin America um, with the resource extraction um, and repression of, of populism. Yeah. What other questions do you have?
So what's your dream? My dream? So oh, well, well, I had a lot of dreams recently, but they kind of yeah, had nothing to do with, okay, <laughs> with anything. Nice. Um, if you want to, yeah. Gives you any um, as a movement or a personal? Blah, 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 that's you, know, a, you can both. You know, talk about it, but... All right. Um, well, um, man, that was a hard question. You know, as a movement, um, you know, I can say as a movement, um, you know, we focus on the School of the Americas, um, and we know that um, um, it's going to be a long struggle to close down the School of Americas because this is an anti-imperialist struggle, right? Um, you're going up against the Pentagon, which, you know, right now as they talk about sequestering, there was just a bill introduced yesterday, I believe, um, talking about trying to, uh, uh, you, know, you know, lessen the impacts of the sequester on the Pentagon, you know, putting billions more dollars into the Pentagon, right? So you're up against this very, this, we're up against an empire, a very well-armed, well-funded, you know, um, with a lot of propaganda behind it, propaganda machine behind it. Um, but we focus on the on the closing SOA as a symbol, um, and we it, the, really and the the thing that we're trying to do is not just close down the SOA because we know that once we close it down, there could be many other training centers, and there are. Um, but also to try and change that culture of militarism, um, you know, and looking at what that looking at what that means, how to change it. Um, how we want to envision a new world. Um, so it's in how we envision relationships between people. The SOA represents um, a very militarized notion of what um, the world is and looking at relationships with countries and between people as, you know, on military to military basis. Um, but we dream of um, a space where there's more people to people connections. Um, you know, we've actually been doing a lot of delegations down to Latin America, meeting with presidents, meeting with uh, defense ministers, um, and asking them, um, connecting with social movements, and asking them to pull out of the School of the Americas. So, actually, there's been six countries that have okay. pulled out of the School of the Americas. I don't know if maybe Andy, you know any of the schools? Um, yeah, I don't know a whole lot about that, but um, I can guess. Yeah, do you want more information? Well, first was 2004, Venezuela pulled out, and Venezuela in 2002 suffered a coup, um, an attempted coup against um, uh, President Chavez um, that was uh, led by SOA graduates, right? Um, then was Argentina in 2007. Um, and they had two of their four military dictators in the 70s and 80s were trained at the School of America. You know, 30,000 people disappeared. Um, then there was Uruguay, which also had SOA grads in, the, in, in their dictatorships there. Um, and then in 2008 was Bolivia, uh, which also we talked about Hugo Banze and many of the struggles there, um, being repressed by SO graduates. Um, and then in just last year, we had Ecuador and Nicaragua pull out, uh, which were, you know, Nicaragua was the first Central American country to pull out of school. So, um, you know, we go there with the idea of people to people diplomacy, connecting with, with um, you know, these social justice movements that, that have been around for a long time, right? um, that have been resisting some for over 500 years, right? Um, so, like, you know, imagining, imagining that that's possible, imagining that we can go beyond militarization. Um, and it also kind of connects in with um, how, when we talk about why the SOA exists, sometimes if we, when we have a deeper conversation with folks, it's like, when well, we're talking about resources, you know, well, why are the resources needed? You know, why do we need so much oil? Uh, why do we need so much, you know, uh, what, you know, wood or water or, you know, all these other minerals and stuff like that? Well, it has a lot to do about how we live our lives, right? Um, you know, it's 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 not it's not just in a bubble that this stuff happens, but it's um, you know we um, because of the American way of life, the U.S. American way of life, you know it requires so much um, natural resources, and those natural resources don't come to us easily. So we need to have that militarization to back it up, right? So it's it's um, you know it, it does put the responsibility on us in a way, uh, but it also opens up a lot of doors for creativity, right? It all, it'll open, like, knowing that, knowing that, you know, we have that power to change the empire, um, to change the relationships, it makes, it makes it a lot more um, space for creativity to actually engage in those trials of how to figure out, you know, engage in, like, you know, in, in experiences, how we can, like, live differently, you know, how we can dialogue differently, you know, how we can be differently, right? And that's, that's what's so, that's what's so exciting, you know, because when we look at, 
um, you know, we just had a had a lunch with um, <laughs> with Paki, and we were talking about all these things, and it's very depressing to hear. You know, like we have drones, we have drone bases being set up, set up in, in Niger, right, in Ethiopia. You know, we have drones killing people in Yemen and Somalia and everywhere, Pakistan, you know. Uh, we, you know, we have all these bases. The U.S. has over a thousand bases around the world, you know. Um, and it's really important to note that, you know, we, there's no foreign country that has a base on U.S. territory, you know. It would be, it would be we would think it would be crazy, right? Actually, when, um, it's in the video, too, when um, That's Why Watch Movement went, went, met with um, President Correa of, of Ecuador, you know, he sent a message to President Bush saying, like, you can have your base. They had a huge base called the Manta Air Base um, in Ecuador. Uh, so you can keep your base here if we have if we can have two a couple of bases in, in Florida. Yeah, of course, like that didn't happen. So Manta the Manta Air Base closed and moved to a more U.S. friendly country, which was Colombia. Right. Um, I lived in Colombia for about four years um, and saw um, kind of firsthand the effects of what was happening there. A lot of the people I knew and were working with were being tortured disappeared, killed, um, and a lot of it was connected to SOA graduates, right? And of course, the, a lot of the violence was happening in areas where there was a lot of oil, where there was a lot of um, minerals, um, and now you have the free trade agreement with Colombia that was just signed last year with the United States, um, you know, on the backs of a lot of death, really, you know, a lot of blood was spilled in order to make Colombia more friendly to U.S. investment. Here. So it's, 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 it's important for us to kind of look at that, and I think that's what that's what I watch is looking towards is like changing that mentality um, and understanding that struggle is not um, an overnight thing. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, sometimes there's a lot of people who think, well, we can just, we just have to change something like this. You know, a lot of us thought that, you know, when Obama came into, into power, um, things would change, right? We had the hope um, of change. Um, and then we realized like quickly that, you know, Things that even this movement, that's why Watch Movement, had been saying, you know, that imperialism is a bipartisan ship, you know, that it doesn't matter if it's Republican or Democrat in power, you're still going to have the same, um, those, those same uh, imperialistic okay, sir, well, adventures yes. will be there, right? Um, so it's really about the grassroots, it's about connecting, it's about you guys going back to school and like telling one, one other person, uh, or more than one person, <laughs> you know, about what you heard. Um, and spreading that information and, you know, getting in touch with um, your, your lawmakers, you know, uh, your politicians, um, coming down to the vigil, really, if you can come down. It's a great event. You can talk to Paki, too. Paki um, is one of the main planners of the event there as well. So, you know, about um, all the, the conferences that we have down there. Um, and it's really a space to network with people from across the Americas, um, you know, from different parts of the United States as well. Um, and um, and it's a really it's really important to go there where the training is happening you know and next week um, there'll be one person who'll be going to trial Nashua Chantal um, he crossed the line in Fort Benning and when we say cross the line it means um, you know in, in usually in the past when we go down to Fort Benning thousands of people would commit this collective act of civil disobedience where we, thousands of people would cross onto the base you know um, and they would just put them in buses and ship them off get them off the base, give them the ticket or something like that, you know. Uh, but it's since 2011, you know, with the Patriot Act and stuff like that, um, things have gotten harder. So, you know, the base started putting in fences. Um, the FBI put us on the counter-terrorism surveillance watch. So you guys are all being monitored right now. Don't, don't freak out. <laughs> um, you know, and so um, there was a lot more repression against the movement um, and people who crossed onto the base um, in a very political trial would get six months in prison. Um, and so the new judge um, has basically said anyone who crosses over gets six months. Um, and, you know, it's a misdemeanor. And if you, if you crossed over, if you went on to Fort Benning any other weekend, it's, you wouldn't get charged. Um, you know, but that weekend, it's, you, can't, you can't get onto the base. Um, so he's, got, he's facing trial next week, and he's facing six months in prison. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of different strategies of closing, you know talking to countries, getting them to pull out of the school, doing direct action to raise awareness in the spirit of the undocumented youth in this country, in the spirit of Martin Luther King, you know, in the, in the, in the 60s, um, you know, this nonviolent civil disobedience is, is a very key part of the movement. Right? Um, and then, of course, through legislation. So in April, we're going to be having our lobby days here in D.C. You know, when you go to, back to Chicago, 
Um, we can give you some postcards, actually, on that. We're trying to send um, 20,000 postcards um, to uh, Dennis McDonough, who's the chief of staff um, for Obama. And um, we met with him last November when he was the deputy national security advisor. Um, and, um, you know, it was the highest level meeting for the movement. Um, in the 23 years of existence. Um, so we're trying to open those doors. You can go into the open heart and be like, hey, you know, you can, you can do something about this. You can close it down. Um, so if you guys want to sign a card too, we can take them right now. And if you want to take some back with you, you know, to share with your folks and then, you know, you can, you can mail them in bulk back to us or you can just get each person to, you know, put a 33 cent stamp on and um, right there and then and mail it in. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Well, something I never um, knew about the SOA is like, where is it known whether or not they're making like the orders and kind of manipulating like the coups and like the, making the kill order mm -hmm. from the SOA, or are they just training them? Yeah. Well, in 1996, um, there was a lot of pressure um, from the grassroots, and they had to re reveal the manuals that they were using, um, and they were in the manuals they were they were saying torture was legitimate um, extortion and the legitimate targets of torture and extortion and all this stuff was were unionists uh, workers students you know and, and people religious workers you know um, and so you know they I don't believe they use the torture manuals anymore after that you know that was a big scandal you know the Pentagon said oh well actually we didn't know we didn't know what the, those manuals said because they were in Spanish. <laughs> so it's yeah, like actually, pretty, if I may interrupt uh, for a second, before they moved the School of America to the United States, it was in uh, Panama, was it? Right. Yeah. They used to use homeless people to practice torture on. Right. And, and they don't. They don't use the. I, I. I really don't think they use the torture manuals anymore. Um, but it's that mentality, you know that. Um, Actually, in 2009, after the coup in Honduras, there was a, I don't know if you guys heard, there was a coup in Honduras in 2009. Um, it was the first coup in over 20 years in Latin America. Um, and um, four out of the six, or after the coup, after the 2009 coup, um, there was an interview with, the, with, with by an army uh, colonel, a Honduran army colonel lawyer named Heriberto Inestrosa, um, who was trained at the School of the Americas. Um, and he was, he was interviewed by the Miami Herald um, and he was defending the coup, and he said, because of our training in the United States, it's impossible um, for us to do uh, work with the leftist government. You know, he said it flat out. Um, and what was the leftist government? It was, uh, you know, the democratically elected government of Manuel Zelaya, who was trying to raise the minimum wage, who was talking about land reform, uh, who was trying to change the constitution, which was, um, you know, signed, which was created under U.S. pressure back in 1982. I would also add that, I mean, as far as not knowing, lots of times you don't, you don't know until much later. For example, the Freedom of Information Act, it was just found out a couple of years ago that the, I think it was 1956 coup in, in, in Bolivia was led by Banzer, who was also a, um, who was SOA grad, I believe. And, um, you know, in the, those conversations, Kissinger was involved, so they, they did green light it. And it's pretty certain that that's what's, what's occurred in Honduras. Of course, we don't have the, the concrete evidence. It's all circumstantial, uh, including the fact that when they um, uh, kidnapped Zelaya, they uh, flew him first. He was the president of Honduras before the coup. Right. Who, and he wasn't terribly left. He was, just, he, was, he was actually center right when he started his administration. He just started moving to the left when he saw that there really wasn't any um, option as far as dealing with the poverty in Honduras and the, and the lack of support for development, of, of actual actual support, not, not, like, not exploitive corporate help um, for the oligarchies. Um, so he started you know, forming a couple you know, alliances with uh, obtaining some uh, benefits for uh, petroleum and, and some other things from, from the, uh, Bolivar, the Alba bloc. Uh, which is, of course, led by the boogeyman of, of Hugo Chavez. Um, but they flew him from his house, from <coughs> the civilian airport to um, to Parmarola. I forget exactly where the flight started, but it landed in Parmarola, which is where the site of the U.S., a huge military base uh, for the U.S. And, and um, it's, it's, it's kind of unclear what, what, why he was, why would he fly there? 
and they stopped and refueled and were on the ground for uh, 45 minutes, um, the U.S. knows about who's coming into their airspace and who's, who's landing in those airports. And then he was, and then the flight took off from there to Costa Rica to, to kind of, um, you know, kind of seal the coup. Um, so it's definitely, um, it's pretty much instilled that, that I, I think a lot of it happens when, as far as maybe intelligence, either from North, I mean, there's 20 something intelligence agencies, foreign intelligence agencies for the US government. So, um, you, know, you have the CIA or the Department of Defense having, uh, knowing, identifying who, who they are, who these generals are that are very, you know, still have the Cold War mentality, still still have a, are, are pro U.S. and and um, you know, as also you can see WikiLeaks that they, that the U.S. still has. I mean, they have, um, they're like another. Uh, I wouldn't. I'm not sure if they're cabinet, but they, they almost they have like de facto. Uh, control over a lot of the appointments made, whether they be ministers uh, or uh, these or higher ups in the military. So um, they're definitely vetted by the U.S. and in, in these countries, especially a country like Honduras, that's that's still um, so close to, to so so under the control of the U.S. And that right now in Latin America, there's a, a lot of the folks who you know who are in training in the '70s and '80s. Now they're in power. They're, you know they might have been the ones doing a lot of the groundwork, killing and stuff like that. But now they're in power and directing the policies. So you know now you have this whole generation that, that legacy will last for many generations. You know, um, but that's why we have to continue to push as well um, from here. So. That's what I was going to ask. Actually, um, the opposite: the generation who suffered during the war. Do you sense or see an increase in the grassroots grassroots movements in these countries among the people who have suffered um, recently? I don't know in the past ten years, because um, the wars were all sixties and seventies and eighties and the nineties and into the two thousands. Um, but now here we are, twenty thirteen. Do you, do you feel something different going on? Yeah, I mean, definitely on many levels. One thing we would to note that the violence continues. Right. Um, you know, even in Guatemala right now, um, you know, on, you know, there's this whole talk about the drug war going into Guatemala. Um, there's a, but there's a lot of people who are being killed who are opposing mining projects. You know, who are, you know, working with communities, um, indigenous communities, um, and groups that are resisting. Um, so, and the levels of violence are actually higher than they were during the civil war. Um, so the violence is there, if not magnified. Um, in terms of resistance, I mean, there's always been for, you know, the history of, you know, Latin America and the history of everywhere, there's been resistance, you know, to domination. Um, and, you know, just the fact that you're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of governments, um, a lot of leftist governments um, appear in South America, um, in Central America now, too. Um, you know, that's, that's a reflection of social movements that are actually pushing back, that have pushed back, that have earned um, you know, that have gained ground over many years of attacks on them, you know. Um, so it's really important to recognize those, um, um, those governments that have come out of social movements um, and, and, and recognize them as products of social movements, um, not as, you know, Arthur was saying in a very sarcastic way, of course, you know, that we, we well, of course, the government, the U.S. government always paints Venezuela as the boogeyman, you know, um, and Chavez is the boogeyman, rather. Um, and it's important to know that it's not really about Chavez, it's about the social movements that have like come out against, um, you know, against privatization, against, you know, um, you know, misery, against poverty, um, that really got Chavez into where he is, you know, and he's, he's kind of the messenger, he's the, the charismatic figure there, um, but it's really the social movements that are always there pushing, 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 and pushing him as well, right? Um, pushing, pushing against the right wing, pushing against, you know, the, the, the state as well. Um, yeah, I mean, even just Venezuela, it's really, just last week it was the 24th anniversary of a really important event uh, known as El Caracaso, where um, uh, the where the president had promised not to push through some neoliberal uh, economic reforms and uh, immediately be able to take in office, he, he did, and people took to the streets and kind of revolted against it. It was like, um, it really was, there was riots and looting, and um, they released, uh, the police and the military onto the streets, and they ended up uh, assassinating 300 to 3,000 people. It's the numbers are still debated, but it was at least 300 and up to 3,000. Some people were just they walked into their homes and just shot them in the back of the head, and 
um, they were, they, they're still uncovering some of the mass graves from that. And you know, Chavez himself and a lot of the people um, point to that as being like the, 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 the most important event as far as uh, what is you know, now known as the Bolivarian Revolution. Um, you know, and then we have you know, Bolivia, um, who, as I, you know, who also has, has pulled their troops and who, who as I mentioned earlier, was uh, the victim of, of a coup in, in 56. Mm -hmm. And uh, the repression of the indigenous people that has you know, occurred historically and, and continued through that dictatorship and, and, and up until uh, recently. Um, there's obviously still some conflict. It's not perfect, but um, you know, it's not a lot of what you see, I think, is uh, we can obviously tie it to the SOA, um, but it's obviously just you know one of the mechanisms that, that are that is utilized that, that are utilized in, in, in Latin America by the, by the U.S. and um, uh, it's just that's it's, it's really uh, this this independence. It's really um, you know there's these hard you know these countries that are supposedly more left as Bolivia, Venezuela, Ecuador, but I think you see the entire uh, all of South America, especially becoming more independent. Um, even the, mo the supposed modern left governments like Brazil, <clears throat> and that's something you know. Now they're forming a regional bloc that's separate from that excludes the U.S. and Canada, um, as they see the OAS as being very flawed, which it is. And um, I think that that's that's the kind of the, the you know that's definitely a direct result of, of, of the the domination of, of the U.S. The, this, and this independence movement and it's. Uh, seems to be something that's a lot of it is pretty um, uh, irreversible, and it's important to see like events like the Caracaso in 1989 is not just like oh it was them it was them in Latin America doing something you know fight rising up because they're all like crazy leftists or you know commies or something like that but you know seeing it also in the you know like in Seattle in 1999 you know this was uh, a year in, in school I was in school you know. This was um, this was a huge um, you know uh, moment for the new the anti globalization struggle in the United States um, and in the world of course um, where you know people unions and everyone in this country came out against the World Trade Organization right um, and so this is, uh, Caracas had happened ten years prior to that you know but we're all very connected you know the the struggles there are connected to the struggles here you know so like seeing that seeing it that it's not just about them and like their issues and. They're all about, you know, just dictate. You need dictators over there, something to like, you know, keep things in check. No, it's it's all about resources. It's all about, you know, uh, do domination. So and connecting with people is important. So. Also, something that we're working on here um, to draw these connections a little bit more. For example, there are coincidentally our lobby days in in, in April. We're we're going to uh, the last day. Are also gonna. They're just, it's going to dovetail with a big immigrant rights march here in uh, Washington on uh, April 10th. And, um, you know, so they're expecting a lot of people. Well, some of us, you know, they said even up to 100,000, we'll see. But, um, you know, we're going to be part of a, um, a root causes uh, contingency that draws attention I, I, to the militarization and, the, and, and, and that effect and the economic exploitation through these free trade agreements um, that cause this. Uh, a great deal of the um, immigration to this country. Uh, for example, you know, since 1994, since NAFTA came, came to, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, well, since it actually <coughs> um, began, they began trading under the auspices of NAFTA, uh, you know, Mexican immigration has, 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 has exploded, exploded after that, given largely <coughs> to do with uh, a lot of the, the farm subsidies. You know, that's one of the few things that Mexico had a comparative advantage over, and, and still the U.S. won't give up the farm subsidies, and then that pushes out all these Mexican farmers, and uh, they either go to the city or they come here, for the most part, uh, since they can't compete with the corn prices or the pork prices that uh, the subsidize the U.S. corn prices and, 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 and other um, staple crops. Um, you know, Mexico, you know, so well known for all of its food based on, you know, the indigenous and, and, the, and the corn, and, and now, you know, the majority of corn is imported from the U.S. Um, and, um, you know, so that's, that's one thing, and CAF did the same thing, you're, you're seeing this huge privatizations going on, the, you know, every FTA, uh, FTA now is, is even, has even more protections for, for, for corporations, more, you know, they're able to sue on, um, not just, you know, on, on projected profits, for example, they're suing El Salvador, 
um, for $100 million, uh, a Canadian company. It's actually a Canadian company that just, uh, they just established a subsidiary in the U.S. basically so they could sue on their CAFTA. Um, and they're trying to say that their environmental protect environmental law that is preventing them from and it's actually really the people people that resisted at the mining it wasn't even it was because it was the right wing government that initially said no to to the to the corporation, um, which you know they were actually for it but they just they felt they were in a political position that they couldn't uh, give them the the mining rights uh, they'd given them the exploratory rights so they're suing for hundred million based on projected lost profits. Um, you know, $100 million, that's, that's um, a huge chunk of uh, the, the country's GDP. There's no way they could pay for that. Um, so it's obviously just this um, uh, pressure tactic to also just hand over their sovereignty, basically. And, and um, you know, it's, it's definitely something that, and now, you know, they're pushing, they're also conditioning AE to El Salvador, for example, on the privatization of some of the few public sector uh, industries that they have left. Um, and that also means union busting, um, and which means lots of people lose their jobs, that the small middle class gets squeezed even more, and, and what do they do? Some of them see that they have no choice but to immigrate, also given the fact that there's already these long established patterns of immigration. I'm, I'm Salvadoran, and you know, so many people, the waves, the first waves of immigration came during wars, which obviously, during the war, which obviously was um, very tied into a lot of the atrocities and the mentality uh, through U.S. military training at the SOA and, and other places. And um, <clears throat> so it's kind of like this, you know, it's a pattern of, 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 of that. And now we have also the drug war on top of it, where you see um, so many people that, you know, I, I have I'm an immigration attorney and everybody, all my clients, you know, most of them, they don't have a very good asylum claim case because they just can't win. It was, it's just it's very difficult to actually prevail on that um, for various reasons. But the reality is that they do flee because of violence. And it's not as simple as saying it's like gangs. It's, a lot of what you hear here is that it's, it's the gangs. But the reality is that um, you know the drug, uh, the drug cartels have infiltrated every level of the government and the police. Um, and at the same time, the U.S. continues to pour money into these institutions that are known to be partying, wor working hand in hand with these drug cartels, and the corruption goes on down. These the gangs control the local turf of, of the drug cartels, but it's really they're really, you know, fighting for pennies compared to what the cartels are making, um, and that's not. It's not. It doesn't seem to be really effective the way this this militarization. That's it's not. Hondurans are very clear. The Honduran social movement and, and they, they want the U.S. military aid to, to cease um, and police aid because it's just it's just escalating the violence. Um, and uh, for example, you compare it to uh, I think it's really important to look at Nicaragua, which had a revolution, which had a leftist government, and it continues to have a. Um, you know, now still the Sandinistas are, are back in power for the last six years, and um, you know they're they don't they're actually slightly poorer than than other countries in Central America, but their levels of homicides and and uh, violent crime is significantly lower, significantly lower, and I think that's really telling as to as to how these tactics don't work don't work. The war on drugs doesn't work. You end up training. The people that are the drug cartels, um, you know, as, as I don't know if Nico mentioned, as you know, for example, some of the most notorious, the the Zetas of Mexico are, um, you know, a lot of them are SOE graduates, were were SOE graduates, and um, it's it's just um, it's it's a disaster and it, it keeps on uh, costing, especially Central America and Mexico, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of people and, and just peace and, and sanity. Right, that, that, the, the thing about the set, there was an article in the Brownsville Herald in October 2003 set, setting that, um, that a, large, a large proportion of the original members of the Setas drug cartel were trained at the School of the Americas as Mexican Special Forces. So now they're going back and, and becoming this, uh, you know, being part of the drug cartels.